I'm just going to run you through a little bit about some work that TLAP's doing to uh, deliver health and social integration for the individual through personal budgets, rather than the title. I'm not going to talk for very long. I want to leave most of the talking to my colleagues here. There's Alex. Alex is going to talk about his line. Zoe's going to talk about some of the work that she's been doing with the personal health budgets uh, pilot project, which is now being scaled up and rolled out. Trudy's going to talk a little bit about the work that they're doing in Oxfordshire to kind of make this stuff happen on the ground. And Andrew is going to talk to us about some of the work that we've been doing together to kind of check out the attitudes and awareness of people and what they think about integration through personal budgets. So, but first of all, I just want to tell you a little bit about the stuff that we've been doing. What do we actually mean by integration at the individual level? We know that integration is increasingly central to um, health and social care policy. You'll know about the um, announcement made back in May by the government about the commitment to integration and the number of um, pioneer sites that are going to be announced in October, I believe. Um, but I think that it's really important for us to think about what integration means for the individual because people tell us that their, their health and social care needs um, you know, they aren't artificially divided, they don't just kind of stop um, wanting or needing something just because it's from a social care budget or it's from a health budget. We know that we need to um, make health and social care organisations work together to deliver seamless and person-centred services. If only it were that easy. The thing is, we kind of know it's already starting to happen. Um, and it's really important that we start to share that early learning and share it widely. Uh, there's an example that I've um, come across in a woman called Mary. Mary is a mum, she has three kids, she has five grandkids. She was very, very depressed. She couldn't talk, she couldn't look people in the face, she had panic attacks when strangers came around. She couldn't go anywhere on her own. Um, her social worker, Jackie, explained to us that um, she had a personality disorder uh, and that sometimes led to self-harming. In one 12-month period, she tried to take her life 18 times. Um, when Mary becomes unwell, it's not just her social work team that needs to work with her, it's mental health colleagues, it's paramedics, it's accident emergency, it's crisis respite support staff. Mary needed a service that the health authority wasn't providing at that time, and that service was long-term therapy. So Jackie, her social worker, worked with uh, Mary's um, uh, health consultants, she worked with Mary, and they kind of started to think about what they needed to do to bring the budgets together so that they could cost out the time that Mary needed from the social work team, they could cost out the time that Mary needed for her psychiatrist, but actually they were also able to find some money that Mary could use as a direct payment to choose a therapist that she trusted, that she liked, that she wanted to work with to help work through some of the things that she needed to. Um, Mary would describe that when she tried to take her own life, that it was a way of just blocking out the stuff in her head, but that when she came back from hospital, none of those issues had been sorted out, they were still there, but choosing someone that she could go and speak to about this helped her work through that stuff. Mary says it's changed a lot. She, in the past nine months, has decreased the number of visits to her psychiatrist, she's decreased the mental health medication that she uses. Her social worker Jackie says that without working together with her health colleagues and with Mary in this way that Mary probably would have gone to hospital at least another three to four times in one year, that she would have been um, spending time in crisis respite, she would have had increased visits from professionals. But for Mary, she says that she's a mum again now, and I think that's, that's the main thing. So TLAP is working with NHS England, we're working with Sky, we're working with NHS Confederation to kind of get behind the mechanics of that story to kind of see what it was that they did, how they worked together, so that we can try and bring that all together and share that more widely. But you don't need to hear that from me. I think the most important thing is to hear this from Alex and from Zoe and from Trudy and from Andrea. So I'll hand over to them. Good afternoon, everybody. Have a nice lunch. Yeah. I'm Alex. <clears throat> I'll just give you a quick, a brief history of myself. Um, I'm an ex-soldier, I served 15 years, um, and I then successfully ran my own farriery business, um, and I was also the, an equestrian tra trainer. 
this took me around the hunting shows of Great Britain, Europe, and I eventually ended up in Houston, Texas, working for the um, Texas Polo Club. I was also fortunate to be able to combine my hobby um, what, with my work as well, as I was, I was, um, <laughs> I was trying to be a successful um, jockey, uh, riding a, as an a, a event rider with my own horses and, and for other people as well. Uh, all in all, I was a bit of an action man, um, and life was just rosy. I was having a fantastic time. Um, unfortunately, I, I started suffering with seizures uh, whilst I was in the States, and when I moved back to Britain, I then had a stroke. So, my life had gone totally down the toilet. Uh, my health now is very fragile, um, and I need frequent trips to the hospital. I couldn't do sort of, well, I couldn't really come to turn, terms with that I, with, that I couldn't do any useful work. Uh, now I have my brain's a little bit damaged and I have physical disabilities. All in all, this, this, this really made me very anxious and, and depressed, um, which uh, ultimately um, led to a breakdown of my marriage. Um, all of which exasperated my mood pretty badly. Um, and as if this were a, this were a country western song, and actually it is true, um, my dog actually did die as well. Um, he, yes, he, met, he, he came up against a badger that was a bit bigger than him. I wasn't badger baiting, he went down the hole. Anywho, so yeah, life was really bad. Um, Um, so I was referred to um, in a mental health team um, as I was uh, somewhat suicidal at the time. Uh, and that, that just became an even more depressing um, scenario because they, they gave me an appointment in three months' time. So I was sort of telephoning them whilst um, hanging over the top of a 20-storey building, you know. Anywho, we, we got over it. <laughs> Uh, because I have a, 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 a depression and, and anxiety problems, and also I'm physically, physically uh, uh, disabled, I became a, a, a great ca a candidate um, to take on the personal health budget as part of the pilot scheme in Northampton. <clears throat> My first reaction was. Um, was one of fear. Um, I, I couldn't really grasp the concept. Now, I thought that they were going to, you know, every bit of treatment I had from the NHS I was going to get billed for, which I've just gone through in America. That's, a, yeah, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm broken now due to that. Um, but um, I eventually grasped the concept, you know, that, that, that services are still there for, to be used freely, availably. Um, it's just empowering yourself to be able to treat yourself, which is a wonderful concept. And also, because I, I, I rely on the government um, to support me, um, I, had a terrible, I do have a terrible guilt trip going on all the time. Um, so, if I can use NHS services on the council services any less, then I'm going to go for it. It's going to make life a bit cheaper. But because of, of my budget and me choosing my own treatments, this being a far more holistic way of treating uh, my medical uh, problems and my mental health problems, uh, therefore, it all goes, you know, if that's going right, that's going right, and then maybe I'm going to start talking to people again and start to socially interact. So, <laughs> it all makes sense, that, but then again, I'm treating to, treating to the converted here, aren't I? <sighs> well, 
Also, <coughs> as a direct result of personal health budget, I became aware of a peer, the peer support system, which really I didn't know existed uh, before then. Um, so I'm a, a very active member of the peer support group for stroke survivors in Northamptonshire. And a group called the People Hub, um, which are a peer support group for personal health budget holders. And they devote an awful lot of time and energy to trying to get this right. Um, and although I had had 12 months of my own personal budget, this is before I got to know the group, so I struggled <coughs> to try and think, to know where I'm coming from or how much I had, etc., etc. So people have, and groups like it are fantastically important um, to help people formulate a plan. Uh, the answer's at the end of the telephone or the internet. Um, far more than any clinician or anybody from the council would ever be able to tell you. My only, my only, um, excuse me, <laughs> reservation would be at the end of my 12 month period of, of having my budget, I, my, my outlook was improving quite dramatically, uh, mentally, physically. Uh, therefore, the, my, my budget, my indicative budget, was then slashed totally in half, um, which really didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, because of my budget, everything was going along quite swimmingly. Now they're going to slash it again, so yes, it was, yes, I felt like slashing myself again. So that is a danger that this should be phased out slowly, 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 baby steps. Anyway, I was asked actually as well when I took my budget on to try and think a bit outside the box. So first thing, I, I really wanted to get fit. But because of my hypertension, blood pressure, I couldn't get a gym membership anywhere. <laughs> um, so I invested in a drum kit. Yeah, frivolous. Huh? No, actually it's not frivolous at all. It's very, very good physiotherapy. It helps my coordination. And it's a lot of fun. And my budget also pays for me to go and take lessons to learn how to play the damn things. Because the day after, I've forgotten how to do it again. I have a PA, which is on everybody's wish list, uh, which is an absolute godsend. Um, she opens the mail, makes sure it's not bad news, because the last thing a depressive wants is, is bad news, isn't it? Um, she helps my diet, yeah, make sure I'm taking my meds, etc, etc. I mean, she does everything that it says on the tin. Um, I bought a sat-nav. Okay, not frivolous. I get getting lost all the time. Uh, now I'm involved with peer groups. I drive out to the villages, pick people up and bring them into the town. So, without my sat-nav, in fact, I wouldn't be here today, in Birmingham, as I drove myself here today. I also invested a little bit in, in technology. I started with a, a, a tablet, and, and from there on, uh, it's, 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 I now am using more uh, tools and aids um, in the IT department. Um, I forget the QWERTY keyboard on a daily basis, so I dictate to my computer now and it types it all for me. Wonderful. Technology is fantastic. And also very important, I pay for my own counselling, which means I can see somebody who I want to see, when I want to see them and where I want to see them. I, have no constraints and there's no waiting list, uh, which is pretty keeping me very much on straight and narrow. Uh, 
And also, as a direct result of the PHP's personnel budgets, uh, I now volunteer for different organisations as well as the stroke <coughs> organisation. Uh, and I, I feel as though I can put something back into society once again. Um, not being able to contribute to society is, it, if, you're not, if you've not been in that position, you really won't know how, how horrible it, it, it does feel. Um, your dignity really is total away, totally taken away. Um, especially when you, you've got to use the word and live off the, the benefits. So now, here I am, sense of purpose, and in fact, I'm almost a human being again. Um, I might put it all down to the power of the personal health budgets. And by empowering me to be part of my recovery, <coughs> I think it's a wonderful thing and it should be applauded. Thank you very much. So, we're just really at the starting point. You've got a, quite a few years head start on us. Personal health budgets were piloted um, from 2009. So one of the drivers for that were lots of people who were getting decent um, social care support using direct payments to employ PAs and so on, who got to the point where their health needs increased and they became eligible for NHS continuing health care funding, where all your health and social care needs are paid for by the NHS. But at that point they had to give up their direct payments because it was unlawful in the NHS to give direct payments. So, eventually the, the kind of government said, okay, we need to look into this, but we don't want to go full throttle. We need to properly evaluate personal health budgets, see what the impact's going to be, whether they work. And you know that introducing anything into the NHS, you have to be evidence-based. So that's what we did. So we had a large-scale controlled trial evaluation involving more than 2,000 people across a whole different range of services uh, and people's situations. So some people who might just be getting a bit of support for their diabetes to people who would have had quite a lot of health support because um, they had multiple health needs or they were eligible for continuing health care funding. And when the results were published last year, it said that um, there were better outcomes for people. So people got a better quality of life and better psychological well-being. Their health status in terms of their health condition and so on and how you measure that stayed the same people have long-term conditions that weren't necessarily going to be cured, um, but they use other health services less. So to me, that means that they're able through a personal health budget to manage their health better, as um, Alex would, tes um, would testify. So they're in hospital less, and they're visiting their GP less. So the, the evaluation said it was cost-effective, especially it gets more cost-effective the more kind of health resource you have in there, the more, the more, um, the more your health needs are. So the government said as a first step that for people getting NHS continuing health care, there would be a right to ask for a personal health budget from next April. So every CCG in the country, when a family or a person knocks on the door, they can ask for a personal health budget and the CCG has to be willing to, has to have systems in place to offer that. And that's from a standing start, so that's no small feat really. Um, the NHS mandate, which was the government's way of telling the NHS what it wanted to see happen over the next few years, also put in another commitment. It's not as specific, but it's an indicator of the fact that this isn't going away. We're not stopping with NHS continuing health care, that it, the government expects personal health budgets to go beyond that. And it made direct payments lawful in the NHS. So, from 1st of April, just gone, it's lawful for the NHS to offer people direct payments. But one of the really critical things that the evaluation said was that um, if you're going to do it, you have to do it right. So as well as um, the benefits of personal health budgets being dependent on how they're introduced, it actually showed that if you introduce personal health budgets in a certain way, you actually made things worse for people. So there's no point in doing it badly. That's the message we're really strongly trying to give the NHS as it, as it um, takes its first steps. So the critical um, factors were people knowing the budget up front, people having decent advice and support. Really, really critically, the most critical one was choice and flexibility over how to spend the budget. If you're going to give people a really restricted menu, again, 
what's the point without you know, actually giving them that control? And choice and how it's managed, so you can take it as a direct payment, third party, or the NHS can continue to uh, manage it. So I guess the, the position we are now is how you go from what was a, a kind of a tight pilot programme where we had um, kind of 20 or so places that were properly committed to this, doing this, and where we've learned so much about the complexity of doing this, and we've also obviously drawn on learning from social care, to scale up so that personal health budgets become real in the NHS but implemented well. And we know that that's difficult to do, and we know that it takes support from all parts of the system. And one of the key factors is that co-production with people. So the work that Alex does locally in Northamptonshire and also nationally with us is absolutely critical. It's a kind of indicator that you understand what it's about and you're getting the, the values of it right, because you know that it's all about working um, with people. What we have already then is leaders from pilot areas, so people like um, Helen here and, and Trudy who's speaking next, so people who've done this in the NHS, which is, there's loads and loads that's transferable from social care, but it is a different <coughs> context, it is a different culture, and there are kind of um, nuances that are different that can tell us how to do this. Uh, people like Alex who've got budgets, and other people who've been involved who, who can tell us how to do it and, and share that and show the way. We've captured everything that we've learned so far, and that's all on our website. What we're doing, as well as um, supporting every CCG to um, try and to get to April next year, so that they can offer some people personal health budgets, not might not be hundreds and hundreds, but just offer the people who come and knock on the door them in a good way as a minimum, so that they're successful for them. We also know that because the government has said that personal budgets, personal health budgets are going to go beyond there that we need to learn what it takes to go beyond continuing healthcare. And I'll come on to um, a slide later that kind of begins to get under the skin of why that's tricky. And the policy position is different from the policy position in social care. So I was involved in the piloting of personal budgets in social care and, and some of the work that went after. And there was a, a target imposed um, that really drove personal budgets. So maybe they wouldn't have happened as well as they have. And lots of people have got them, and that's a good thing. But we know that when the government puts targets in place, that the, the system doesn't feel like it can achieve, that it, it corrupts them, basically. It'll, it'll find other ways to tick boxes without doing it properly. So at least our policy position at the moment is kind of bottom up. It relies on people knocking on the door. So we need to get information out there so that people know they have that right. But at least it's, it's kind of not top down. And as I say, it's not been easy. The NHS, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's turned upside down over the last year or so. Um, we've worked, we've got 170 now uh, CCGs signed up at chief executive level to our support programme to learn through lots of different programmes that we're putting in, one like a training programme where they come one day every month for six months to learn how to put personal health budgets in, in place for April. Um, so we've got lots going on to try and bring the, bring the NHS along with us. But thinking about where we go next and what the potential for joint budgets are, there's a number of different areas, I guess. Continuing healthcare is all NHS money, but there's, there's lots of people who get um, assessed for NHS continuing healthcare, and Trudy will talk more about this, who aren't eligible for it, they still have significant health needs. So there's lots of people there who probably be getting social care and have significant health needs. There's real potential for joint budgets there. The other area, though, is um, lots of people with long-term conditions. And one of the biggest um, <coughs> things that we're seeing over the last few years, and, and people keep talking about as the pressure on the NHS and all these kind of things, is the rise in people with um, long-term conditions, but also the rise in people with lots of different long-term conditions. So, say, for example, a lady um, from Birmingham called Pat, who had COPD, which is a really not, you know, really horrible breathing um, uh, problem. Um, she became more and more confined to her house because she um, she was really really anxious about getting breathless as she um, as she went out and about, which then led to um, her becoming more and more isolated, more and more down. Um, and her COPD nurse um, was really really concerned about that. Um, but didn't. But she's a COPD nurse. She wasn't necessarily knowing how to get into the kind of the mental health system if somebody needed some support around that. 
Um, Pat had been on a pulmonary rehab course, which is where a kind of a, a trained nurse will um, do lots of really good exercise with a group of people with COPD to, to help them learn how to keep as healthy as they can. That had ended because they're usually like eight week courses or whatever. She kept in touch with that group, but they, they were kind of losing momentum. So Pat, um, so, so kind of getting to the bottom of what would really help there um, is, is, is not particularly easy through. She had a COPD nurse who she really liked. She'd been on a successful pulmonary rehab program, but things weren't getting better for her. Things were getting worse. And people with COPD, you'd go to hospital a lot. Um, so she used her personal health budget to um, buy um, an exercise bike that she uh, shared with the rest of her pulmonary rehab um, uh, group and they hired a, a hall and they, they recreated those exercise classes together and that as well got a reconnect back physically more confident in getting out and about and back connected in with people. She also bought some counselling and so on to, to help her through the, the panic and the anxiety and the depression. But thinking about the NHS as it is, where does that money come from? She wasn't actually going to not use you know, her COPD nurse had been great, you know, and a real support to her. We're not going to sack her. her the pulmonary rehab course had been really, really helpful and given the whole group a really good sense of what they could achieve through exercise. That's what she was getting apart from going into hospital when things got worse. Um, the only really way to unlock this is to look at that opportunity across the whole health and social care system to reduce the use of the health services like the hospital services. So it's taking somebody's whole use of, of healthcare and, and you're looking at kind of social care things as well. And eventually it is about being brave and disinvesting in some of the stuff that people shouldn't need anymore when the scale personal health budgets were introduced successfully. That's a long way from where the NHS is able to even contemplate at the moment and that's politically really tricky. So, thinking about what it would drive to, what it would take to really drive personal health budgets and to drive for really personal health budgets or help drive integrated health and social care budgets. Because really, until you, you in social care have somebody to engage with on the health side who really gets this, who's done it in practice, who knows what it's all about, um, it's, it's kind of difficult there to start, um, to start a partnership and start looking at integrated budgets. The NHS really needs to understand and be shown what problem this solves. What problem for the NHS is easy and it's, it's out there, the benefits for people. But until we can prove at scale how this also solves a problem for the NHS in terms of use of hospitals and budgets and so on, at scale, not just kind of in a pilot programme, we need, it's not going to kind of, um, they're not going to find it, I guess. Um, we also need some clear next policy steps, and I guess those will be coming from, from the Minister, so they need to be really clear and tell the NHS what the next steps are that it has to do. Critically, we need values-led leadership from all sides, so um, that means leaders in very powerful positions in the system who work alongside people with that real expertise in their own lives and getting the personal health budget to build something that's really tied to what's important and keeps it. That keeps it real as we keep talking about today, make it real. And then there needs to be lots of things to help the NHS, including alignment of kind of incentives and mechanisms to, to free up the money. So there's lots of challenges around this. We'd be um, being very naive, we, we said there was decent traction for this in the NHS, but it is there and it is coming and through continuing healthcare, every part of the NHS is trying personal health budgets. And it's only really through <coughs> making them work for people that, people that the NHS will take ownership and begin to see the benefits, and they will see the benefits if they do this well. And it's difficult, making, especially even making um, joint budgets between health and social care work means, as Trudy will tell you, unpicking parallel systems that are very complicated and bureaucratic to try and create something new, and that takes a lot of work and dedication. But the opportunities are, I guess, around um, people just under the continuing he um, healthcare threshold where you could do more with the resource that's going in by pulling together those health and social care um, resources and budgets and, and planning around some of these whole needs to properly address what's important to them. And then also looking at the, um, the, the reduced use of other hospital services and GP um, visits and so on. 
And I think we've got um, a trick here as well to try and hook into some of the things that do have real momentum in the NHS. So integration pioneers, I really, really hope, and I, I, you know, I, I believe that there might well be, but we haven't made the decisions yet, there will be some of those integration pioneers who will try and join the health and, health and social care personal budgets. post winterborne lots of people get you know, who, are, who are really, have really complex um, people with learning disabilities who have other health needs and, and, and the complex um, and, and, and um, assistance signs really difficult to, um, to support. They're the people who end up getting sent to places like Winterbourne, aren't they? And that's a place where there's a real good plan around the person bringing in the health resource as well as the social care one to be with. I also think if you look at the money that's gone into the Integration Transformation Fund, you look at the, which is things like the Able Month, which were used in the pilot program to, to be able to test this stuff out in long-term condition services. And if you um, look at the objectives for the Integration Transformation Fund around person-centered care and, and prevention and all those kind of things, and you look at the problem we've got of not being able to free up money to put into personal health budgets, the, the ITF is a key area that I would really hope the health and wellbeing boards will be looking at in order to try and drive personal health budgets because they could be a real win-win for people and for the system. That's me. My name is Trudy Reynolds. I work in Oxford. I work for a community trust. Uh, Oxford is a large rural county just south of here, as you know. Um, and we have recently merged with our mental health trust and are still suffering the pains of not being able to order what we want from the stationery catalogue. Does that make you anybody recognise that? So we're still suffering the pains of um, merging with the Mental Health Founder and the Caring Foundation Trust. We have five large community hospitals the, um, and some, uh, two acute hospitals as well. And we were an in-depth pilot site for personal health budgets, offering people um, eligible for NHS continuing care personal health budgets. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment and how that's helped inform us um, and help drive us towards offering people with joint health and social care budgets a better offer than we did before. We already have um, a number of joint health and social care funded packages. Actually, we've got quite a lot of those. We've got about um, 450 people with um, joint funded packages at the moment. And we, um, we're very lucky, we're, uh, as I say, a large County, we are co terminus with our county council boundaries, so we don't have lots of different county councils or borough council or district councils to deal with. We've had a section 75 in place for about 10 years, and we have pool budgets for mental health, physical disability, LD, and older people. So even before the legislation allowed the NHS to make direct payments, we were making direct payments to people through our pool budget. So um, but that's, hence we have so many of them. And what I would describe the system as at the moment is a bit of a dual carriageway. So health does have it, social care do their bit, but somehow the money does end up in the right person's account on the right day. We hope, most of the time. But that's as far as integration goes in Oxfordshire. We don't do much more than that. And because of the way the health um, is funded and social care is funded and because people see one set of money in their bank account it becomes complicated and difficult to understand and we talk to people about oh well that's health funding you might only get that for a few weeks because it's just about giving you a medication or it's just about putting on your ten stockings or it's just about and then it disappears and that is very difficult for people to understand and it's very complicated so that's what we're trying to address so I think for us the joint fund funded packages, I'm sure you all know that, is about people whose primary need is social care, that there is some health um, needs there too. There, we also offer people funding for um, who are self-funders also, so it's really important. I know most people who are social care, um, but actually we have an obligation to meet those needs as well. And actually if we can um, offer people who are self-funders a better deal and a better way of managing their care, we hope that we can keep them out of social care for longer, actually, as we go forward. Um, and also, as people tip into and occasionally come out of continuing care, if we've set up a package of care in the right way, we know that we can keep that going and, and, and people can transition in and out much more easily. And that becomes particularly important for children. 
We're not great at doing anything well for children as they've come into transition. Um, so this is really important. How we deliver funding for health tasks in Oxfordshire is through what we call delegated health tasks. So I don't know how other people do it. Some people do it through um, a 70-30 split at a panel meeting. We do ours through delegated healthcare tasks. And they're split into five levels. And they get more health um, intensive <coughs> as you go through the levels. So generally levels one and two are social care tasks. Um, so they would be probably put, they would be giving certain types of medication, they would be putting on TED stockings, etc. As you get into level three and four tasks, those are tasks that are funded by health and they can include some tracking care, bowel care, much more complex health tasks. And when you get to level five tasks, um, those can only be delivered by a healthcare professional. So those would be really our district nurses <coughs> in this situation. So what have we done so far? Um, we have 50 personal health budgets working for people eligible for CHC funding. We've got a number of that are sitting outside of that, but really 50 for um, personal health budgets for CHC. Everyone who is now eligible for a continuing care in Oxfordshire is offered a personal health budget. We have found an amazing amount of success with those clients in as much as um, we used to have the inevitable call on a Friday afternoon that care was breaking down. Often they were from families who had used every single care provider in Oxfordshire and no one would take them on. And at half past four on a Friday, we'd get that call, oh, I've thrown the care provider out, what, what can you do? And it was really very difficult for us. So um, we, have, we don't have those Friday afternoon calls anymore. People are managing the care and their care and support much more effectively than we ever could. I don't say our continuing care budget has gone down, it hasn't, but what we are doing is delivering a lot more hours of care within the same budget. So we also have worked with our local authority, we have a long standing relationship with our local authority. So we now have joint contracts for external providers. So all of our managed accounts, payroll, etc., is all done through the same contract. So we just piggyback on the back of our local authority and they deliver those for us or alongside us. We, um, our local authority also make all of our direct payments. And um, so that's great for people because they are dealing with exactly the same people. We also use the same broker services, and um, employment advice and support services. We are just about, we've just about finished reviewing our delegated healthcare task list. At the moment there, is, there aren't any mental health tasks in there at all. We used to have about one person a month, I think, that used to come out of um, the John Ratcliffe with a peg feed. Now we get about eight a month. The complexity of people that are coming out of the acute sector, and you must see that too in social care, is enormous, and that has a massive knock-on effect in terms of how we're going to continue to fund those and how we're going to train people. So as new things are coming into the market and as people want to offer other services, we are having to review our delegated healthcare task list and increase that. Going back to um, training for things like peg feeds, we're piloting a new model for training PAs. We absolutely have to be sure, in, and I'm sure this is true of social care in the NHS, that when we are handing over public money, that the people we're handing it over to are well trained and can deliver the support services that they need to. Some of the care that people are staying in the community with is extremely complicated, and they are still not sitting inside of CHC, so they're still being managed by both the health and social care budget. So, also, we have a big problem in Oxfordshire of delayed discharges, often because we just can't get PAs trained and into people's homes quickly enough and signed off of, um, as, as being competent to, try, to deliver the tasks they're um, trained for. So we're piloting a new model for training PAs. We count, to set a budget at the moment, we count the number of minutes it takes to deliver each delegated healthcare task. So we have five minutes for flushing a peg. We have 20 minutes for um, complicated bowel care. We have, and that's, we count all of those minutes up, times them by a number, which is that it costs to a PA or a, an agency, and that's how we've come to the budget. 
and, the, and we've been doing that for a long time and we realised that A, it takes our professionals a long time to complete this list, but also it doesn't actually deliver what people want. We don't take into account what services they have there already, what PAs they've got coming into the home, what family members are doing. So we're working very hard with social care to simplify those budget setting tools and hopefully come up with something that's a much more holistic offer, which is what we do in continuing care. And we are, so as part of that, what we're trying to do is pilot a new model for support planning. So we're at the moment working with about 10 complex cases where we are offering the same level of support in planning people's care and, and developing a care plan as we do in continuing care. I have to say, we have 50 people with a personal health budget. Oxford County Council have two and a half thousand people with a direct payment. It is a massively different scale. So the amount of support we are offering people with a personal health budget is completely different to the support that people are getting when they get a direct payment from social care. And what we're trying to do is unpick and work with our local authority so that the offer we give people is the same. Okay, so what next? We're doing, we're working on a more holistic offer. But this, uh, this sounds really straightforward and it just isn't. So ridiculous things like, if you have a personal health budget, we pay for your employer liability insurance every year. In our local authority, they pay for it for the first year and then they expect you to make savings to pay for it following that. So actually unpicking what the offer is across the two different organisations is different. Social Care have five or six years more experience than we do, and as I say, they're doing it at a very different scale to us. We are looking at workforce issues. We have uh, massive cultural changes to make in the NHS, but we also know that people have to come with us. We don't have a huge market for PAs. We are trying desperately to develop our training and that we're offering people and trying to keep PAs in the service as well. As I said, simplified budget setting and accessible timely training for PAs is a big thing for us. And we are trying to get a joined up approach for reviewing frameworks that have been in place for a long time. So, for example, the delegated healthcare tasks and how we set budgets. At the moment, a thousand people have to be consulted to make one small change. So we need to, as the, as the NHS is changing and as we're offering different tasks, we need to make sure we do that. And I'm not even going to talk about information and data. <laughs> Everyone knows about that. Okay, I'm finished. So we know that there's a strong government um, commitment to this agenda. And we know that we have great opportunities to improve outcomes for people because we know that through offering personal health budgets. The massive challenge for us is how do we roll it out at scale? How do we go from the 50 to the 450 people and offer them the same? And how do we join together to make sure the offer we're giving people is the same? And, and, but, and I also have to say, there is no appetite in Oxfordshire for a ma another massive organisational change, either in health or social care. So we have to kind of do this within the resources and in the organisation systems we have. So that final message um, that Judy left us with was how to roll this out at scale, um, working within the money that we've got and the organisational structures that we've got. Couldn't have you know, dreamt of a better line to lead into what I'm going to talk about, um, which is um, work that um, we've been doing um, with Sky and Tila to support the integrated um, uh, personal health and social care budgets um, work, um, work stream that we've got. So I'll just set the context on some work that we did at Sky, which we published last year, which was looking at the factors that help and hinder integrated working. And, you know, it's a wonderful research briefing, number 41, for anybody who fancies having a look at it. Um, but I boil it, those 20 odd pages down to five things. And basically, we need to make sure that we've got a clear vision, um, that people understand and buy into, that roles and responsibilities are defined, that there's good information and communications, um, that uh, culture is addressed and understood, um, and that leaders are empowered um, and, and, and provide that leadership to make it all happen. So we've heard a bit about vision from Zoe um, and also the personal story from Alex, which I think inspires and we can all kind of buy into that. 
Um, a bit around the roles and responsibilities in, in the Oxfordshire uh, example. Obviously the work that TMAP is doing and an awful lot of today has been focused on is around information and communications um, and you know, seeded all the way through that is the issue of culture. So I'm going to focus on leadership um, and how do we, in trying to ensure that we want to um, uh, roll out at scale within what we've got at the moment, how do we actually make sure that the leadership criteria for making integrated um, working really work effectively, how do we make sure that we're addressing that properly. So what we, we did was to focus our work on wanting to engage the leadership of the health and social care organisations and citizen leaders um, as well um, to promote integration through the use um, of health and social care budgets. So, you know, no difficult task there, really. Um, and what we thought that we, we wanted to do was because we, I had a bit of a, uh, an idea about what, um, uh, what the situation was around all of this. Um, but as I said this morning, Sky um, is an organisation which is about sharing knowledge. So we kind of thought that my gut instinct um, and feminine intuition, which I grant you, I think is fabulous, but it's not really an evidence base. Um, so we thought that we'd talk um, with some of those um, key leaders to find out what their views were on the challenges and the opportunities around personal budget integration. So that's what we, we did, and that's the royal we, because my colleague Jane Greenstock, one of our research assistants, actually conducted um, uh, the semi-structured questionnaire interviews with a variety of people. And she did a great job. Um, the headlines from the survey. The vast majority of people that we talked to were actually very positive about the potential of integration of personal health and social care budgets. And I think, you know, if you'd... If all you'd ever done today was sit and listen to Alex's story earlier, I think we'd all end up saying, yep, we're positive about that because we can see what the outcomes are for individuals and the positive benefit um, that that brings. But we also got um, some clear messages that for colleagues, and particularly colleagues in health, that actually personal budgets may not be the priority. There's a ton of other things that we're trying to do at the, at the moment. And where does personal budgets and those being a spur um, uh, uh, for integration, <coughs> where do they come um, in that pecking order? And that we also, from the survey, um, identified some of, the, um, some of the challenges. So that fifth, um, uh, one of those five uh, criteria that I identified around the factors that help and hinder integrated working cultural obstacles um, you know, came up time and time again. Health and social care, we speak different languages. I've actually worked in both, so I do speak both, um, and sometimes I do feel like I'm a translator um, uh, between uh, different people in the room. There is a very crowded agenda um, in terms of the different things. But I, I can't remember how long the mandate is for NHS England, but you know it's not a short document. Um, there's a few things that we're expecting them to do, and we know that that's the same um, for people uh, in social services departments. And we've just gone through, as so is all, uh, uh, and uh, Trudy have both said, a massive organisational change in the health service. And actually one of those things about culture and information and communications is the relationships that we develop and the trust that we develop um, through working with each other. And of course we chucked some of that um, equation up into the air and brought it back down in a different framework. And so we're starting to have to build some of those relationships again. Which is, um, you know, people are doing, um, but uh, we, we need to work on. What we also drew out uh, of the survey were some queries around the financial infrastructures um, and how this is going to work practically. And obviously, you kind of knew the, the work that Zoe and Trudy is doing um, at a national and a local level, you're know, trying to tease out some of those things. Issues that we've picked up from a social care perspective around the monitoring processes um, and the procedural issues. You know, how do you actually get it done and sort of how do you make the bureaucracy work and how do you kind of satisfy um, the risk and audit committee around how you're doing all of this? Um, you know, uh, were, were tricky issues that people um, identified. 
Um, and the, the other two areas that people um, picked up on um, were, were those uh, points about what, what were the wider budget implications and what actually has been the impact. And so it's very interesting to hear Trudy saying, well, we haven't actually reduced our continuing care um, budget, but we've increased the amount of service that we provided. Um, and also for Zoe to say, you know, we've got to be able to demonstrate to colleagues in health that there is a positive thing for them to be um, uh, uh, taking from uh, personal budgets and for them to work with their colleagues in social care around integration of them. The other thing that we were asking people was, well, okay, so you're enthusiastic, you kind of like the idea, but you've got all of these sort of niggling little worries um, about how it goes and how you can do it. So what are the resources that actually might help? You know, how can we make a difference around this so that we can move this forward? And some of the things that came back were really interesting, actually. So one of the um, uh, uh, messages was, actually, let's get some myth busters out there. You know, people don't really know what we're talking about um, when we're talking about personal health budgets. And it was really telling what Alex said about kind of his first sort of, you know, reaction to, well, I'm going to have a personal health budget was uh, being a bit scared. You know, what did that mean? Um, and there were other people who think this is the thin end of the wedge in terms of in the future, we'll all be paying for our, our, our health um, out of our back pockets, um, our own personal back pockets, and it's not going to be a free at the point of service um, uh, service as we as we currently have. So there's a lot of suspicion around there, which actually getting some real life stories um, and uh, uh, explanation about what the potential is and how it's working, what's actually happened in social care and the positive impact that it's had would be really good. The other bit about the good stories um, was also about understanding how the money has played out um, and what that has meant. Um, so it may not mean that actually we've saved money in terms of um, uh, reducing resources, but it may be that we've got better value for money through using those resources more effectively. Um, and actually thinking about from a person-centered, personalized version of care, what are the outcomes that individuals um, want to achieve and how are we achieving those? And if we are achieving those through this, um, uh, this mechanism, then actually that's effective and it's uh, potentially cost effective as well. There was also a real issue around saying, well, what do, what's the roles of all of the different professions in all of this? And I think that we've had this in social care in terms of you know, the impact um, on the role of social workers through the implementation um, of personal uh, budgets. And actually, I think that you know, social workers have been brilliant around it in terms of supporting and empowering people um, to use that. And you know, the, some of the core skills that social workers have absolutely fantastically kind of used in, in that environment. And we probably need to think about how do we make that work for people um, in other areas, particularly um, nursing. The great thing about some of the issues that people raised in terms of what the resources were that would help is actually we've got quite a lot of this already. Acronym City here, obviously, but um, NHS England has got some of that work, and Zoe's been doing a grand old job. Um, the Think Local Act Personal um, and Towards Excellence in Adult Social Care, the King's Fund, there's a whole host of people, um, as well as uh, some of the peer support and uh, user led organisation networks um, that actually can provide <coughs> some of this material that will help. So, what's next? Um, uh, what we want to do is to galvanise the leadership community because actually, the, um, I can't remember who said it, but we're potentially preaching to the converted in this room and it's fabulous that you're all here and that you're listening and that you're interested, but actually we need to be getting to a whole load of people out there and we need to be getting to senior people and getting them to understand that personal budgets do indeed um, matter and need to be a priority. We need to look at the existing materials that we've got so we can do um, and to work out what we need to do differently. And we've been hearing elsewhere about the personalisation summit and the action plan, and I would definitely like to see this on that. Thank you very much.